morning, HEC family. Today's scripture comes from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verses 14 through 16. And it reads, If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and heal their land. Now my eyes will will be open and my ears attentive to the prayers offered in this place. I have chosen and consecrated this temple so that my name may be there forever. My eyes and my heart will always be there. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we just want to first of all just give you thanks, Lord. Thank you that you are a God who cares. Thank you you are a God who who looks upon your people, Father. Thank you that you have shown us and that you've chosen a people out of this world, Lord, to represent you, to show your love, to be a demonstration of your power for whom you receive glory. And Father, thank you that you have chosen to correct the world by starting with us. And Father, help this message to get to all the people, to their hearts, their minds, to where we look at ourselves, Father, and see where we have sinned. And let us humble ourselves before you, Father, so that you can do great things through us and glorify your name. So Father, let the work of correction begin with us and heal our land, Father. Heal our land as you said you would. And we just give you praise and honor. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You get the glory. You get the praise. Take all the honor. And I just want to say thank you. You get the glory. You get the praise. Take all the honor. Thank you. You get the glory.
Well, greetings and blessings, Higher Expectations Church family and friends who are watching this broadcast today by way of uh, the internet or social media platform that you might be on. Uh, I want to just take the time to thank you for your faithful commitment over these last three months that we've not been able to meet as a church. And I want to remind the Higher Expectations Church family that on Father's Day, we're going to have a midday service starting at 1 p.m. at Providence Community Church. It's not going to be a long service, but it's going to give us an opportunity to come together as a church body in worship. We're gonna be practicing social distancing. We're going to have gloves and hand sanitizer. We're gonna be spread out. It's gonna be a great time. So mark your calendars, Father's Day, 1 p.m., Providence Community Church. More information can be found on our website. Uh, I want us to jump in this morning, given all of the social, uh, spiritual unrest that our country has faced. And to be quite honest with you, uh, it has kept me up many nights. Kept me up many nights trying to figure out what should the church response be, and more particularly, what should our response be as a church here at High Expectations Church. This morning, if you have your Bibles, if you'll go with me to Galatians chapter 2, verses 11 through 14, I want to thank uh, Deacon Vic Coleman for leading us in scripture and prayer reading this morning, and the worship team uh, for bringing us worship. So we're in Galatians chapter 2, uh, and we want to particularly look at verses 11 through 14. And then we're going to kind of work our way back a little bit into the text and into what we're trying to get across this morning as we look at gospel-centered racial reconciliation. Let me say that again. Gospel-centered racial reconciliation is our tag topic for this morning. Look at me here in Galatians chapter 2, starting at verse 11. He says, but when Cephas came to Antioch, that's Peter, I opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For he regularly ate with the Gentiles before certain men came from James. However, when they came, he withdrew and separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision party. Then the rest of the Jews joined him in this hypocrisy, so that even Barnabas was led astray by their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were deviating from the truth of the gospel, I told Cephas in front of everyone, if you were a Jew, Live like a Gentile and not like a Jew. How can you compel Gentiles to live like Jews? Father, we thank you and praise you and magnify you so much. We ask that you give us a ready word, that you open our ears, our hearts, our minds, that we might receive this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. So I've literally spent countless hours in discussions, uh, in attempt to discern the current cultural climate and crises that we find ourselves in this country as well as the local body of Christ. Uh, asking questions, right, on why there's so much chaos amidst a place where there was once so much calm. What has or hasn't awakened the spiritual and social consciousness of the church and the nation? How do we get here at this very moment in time? Thanks be to God that there is a historical narrative that helps us to understand this. In 2 Chronicles 15, verses 3 through 6, you'll read words like this. For a long time, Israel was without the true God, without a priest to teach, and without the law. Let me say that again. For a long time, Israel did its own thing. There was no teaching going on. There was, there was no priest bringing the word of God. There was nobody taking a stand for God. Verse 4 says, but in their distress, they turned to the Lord, the God of Israel, and sought him and was found by them. In those days, it was not safe to travel about, for all the inhabitants of the land were in great turmoil. One nation being crushed by another and one city by another because God had troubled them with every kind of distress. And the question came to me, could God be troubling us? By us, I mean very distinctly the church, God's chosen people. Could God 
be troubling us in this season? Could he be troubling our hearts? Could he be, could he be troubling the fact that we have made 11 o'clock the most segregated hour in our nation on Sundays? Could he be troubling us because our programs have trumped our people? Could he be troubling us because we are more concerned about events than we are about justice and mercy? Could he be troubling us? I believe God is troubling us. I believe that God is troubling us that we might turn to him and him alone to find solutions amidst this current chaotic moment. You see, Paul's letters to the Galatians, I believe, will find a compass to guide us as the church to help others as we move forward. See, right out the gate, the Apostle Paul lays out for us a roadmap on how we should live in a diverse and divided culture as believers. He reminds us that we've been what we've been given in Christ. And then he leaps over into chapter two. Paul demonstrates for us the importance of unity in the body by chump chumping up on Peter and reminding him what we've been called to do. And particularly, Paul brings this here to light as he as he elevates and exposes racial bias or racism in the church. See, the growing division between Christian Jews and Christian Gentiles needed to be put to rest as the church has been called to unity in the Christ regardless of our race. See, this is where we jump in. You remember Jesus' prayer in John chapter 17, and he says that he prayed to the Father that as the Father and he was one, that we, the church, would be united as, as one. We've all heard uh, and, and read where it says, by this should all men know you, my disciples, how you love one another. We know that Matthew 22, when we look at all of the commands, they ask Jesus, what does all the commands lay on? He says, on these two, hang all the law and the prophets, that you love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, and soul. And the second is like unto it, that you love your neighbor as yourself. But don't stop at Matthew chapter 22, verses uh, 27 to 29. Keep going to Matthew 23 and 23, where he scolds the Pharisees of the day by telling them it was good that you tied and did the mint and cumin and all that, but you should have also practiced this justice and mercy. So God is calling the church, amen, to wrap his arms around the current cultural situation and moving us forward under the umbrella of the gospel, both with love, justice, and mercy. So if you just go back with me in Galatians chapter 1, and I just want to lift out a few things that Paul here is lifting out for our benefit and Paul, he writes to the Galatian church. And look what he says in Galatians chapter 1, uh, verse 1. Paul, an apostle, sent not, by, not from men nor by men, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers and sisters with me to the churches of Galatia. Grace and peace to you from God the Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who, watch this here now, gave himself for our sins to rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of God the Father. He says now, he says, he says, do you see what God has done for you and I? He has rescued us. He has redeemed us from this current present evil age. He has come in and he has bought us, amen, by the blood of Jesus to call us this chosen people, this holy nation, this set apart people, God himself under the umbrella of the gospel has brought us near to him and near to each other. See, we must never forget that we are the people of salt and light. We are the people who are God's people who are to bring him glory forever and ever. But it doesn't stop there. If you and I were to look, we would have to look at verse 4, and we would have to ask ourselves the questions, do you know who you are? Do you know that you are God's child, that you are the child of a king? Do you know whose you are? Right? Who do you belong to? Do you know what God has provided for you and I in Christ Jesus? Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, you are the redeemed, blood-bought, blood-washed, rescued, and chosen people of God. Listen, my dear brothers and sisters, again, you are the redeemed, blood-bought, blood-washed, re rescued, and chosen people of God. One old pastor in southwest Louisiana used to say to me all the time, your daddy is a king. Act like you're the king's child. So we have to put in some work. We have to put in what I call some real kingdom work. He also warns us, if you'll just stick with me for a few minutes, we're going to get to our text. 
He warns us how easy it is to drift away from the call of God in the gospel to theological jargon and social positioning. Let me say that again. He warns us, look at verse 6, how easy it is to drift from the gospel to theological jargon and social positioning. Look what he says in Galatians chapter 1 verse 6. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. In other words, he says, you guys are beginning to, to veer away from the truth of the gospel, from the redemption of the, the, the redeeming gospel. You guys are getting into all kinds of other things. And, and in fact, here, here's what it was. They were telling them, you now have to be circumcised. You have to be under the law. You have to move away from grace. You have to separate and divide. You all are getting into another gospel. Let it never be said of the church. And this generation that we are drifting from the gospel. No, let it be said that we're holding tightly unto the gospel as if our very lives depended upon it. And so from here forward, he's laying down his credentials and calling uh, uh, what happens and, 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 and following through the first half of the chapter onto chapter two shows us that he has put in work as an apostle and that God has rewarded him with souls being transformed by the grace of God and that people have been set free in, the, in, in Christ, work with the liberty Christ has set them free. And that brings us to our text this morning. Look here at our text, verses 11 through 14, because Paul is clearly talking about uh, the issue of gospel clarity, the issue of gospel clarity, right? Look what he says. He says, but when Cephas came to Antioch, I opposed him face to face. He stood condemned, for he regularly ate with the Gentiles before certain men came from James. However, when they came, he withdrew and separated himself because he feared those from the circumcision party says, in other words, Peter lacked courage to stand on gospel truth. He lacked courage to say what God had already told him in Acts 10. He lacked courage, amen, to say that these are my brothers in Christ. And though we may look different, though we may have some, some cultural differences, though we, may, though, though we may not align 100%, but around the gospel there is truth, there is grace, there is mercy, there is justice. And Peter was pulling back and Paul said that we were, he was drifting, that he, he lacked courage and Paul stepped to him. You say that for pastor because whenever we see racism raise his head, we see disunity raise his head, we, the body of believers, must step to other brothers and sisters and call them back to gospel clarity. See, real gospel community will require gospel-centered confrontation. Real gospel community happens when we can come to the table and confront issues of our heart. That's why David says in Psalm 51, creating me a clean heart, renewing me a right spirit. Purge me, God, Father. Search my heart. That's why you see that language because, because until we are challenged with the gospel, amen, what we're saying is I'm okay, you're okay. I'm going to do my thing. I'm going to allow, allow the culture to lead me and not Christ and the gospel. And, and so Paul challenges Peter, and by doing so, he's challenging us. What the Apostle Paul does for this brother is to fight for healthy, healing community by addressing unhealthy convictions. Peter has had yet another lapse in liberty by allowing his need for acceptance of others to override the need for the gospel to transform his heart and the hearts of those who may be on the wrong side of the issue. Rather than grasping and, and, and grabbing and standing on the clarity of the gospel, Peter enters into a fuzzy land of cowardly contradictions. Paul, on the other hand, has chosen to continue his ministry by launching, right, what, what, what I would say is, is, is a gospel-centered way of dealing with unjust circumstances when people are treated unfairly. Paul has continued his ministry by coming at Peter in this way and by calling Peter out and doing it, amen, in Matthew 18 style. He didn't talk about it. He didn't, he, he didn't post. He didn't write a letter and say, y'all know what Peter is doing. No, the Bible says he stepped to him and it says face to face. See, if we're going to deal with the issues of our day, we're going to have to learn how to lean in. 
That means we're going to have to come to the table and lean in with each other. We're going to have to learn how to listen to each other. We're going to have to learn how to learn from each other. And most importantly, we're going to have to learn how to love one another. Yes, those, those, those are the things that are going to move this racial divide in the church further down the road. You said, Pastor, in the church? Yes, in the church of Jesus Christ. And it should not be. We need what I call the rare factor, real Authentic relationships every day. R A R E. Real, authentic relationships every day. Why does Paul buck up on Peter? Because the gospel is the real antidote to true biblical community. And it must be magnified above everything else. Amen. God has joining a people together. That's why in Revelation, he says, I saw a number that no man can count of every tongue, tribe, and kindred standing at the throne of God and worshiping him. Peter has chosen to return to the cultural comfort zone as I've always called it, and giving in to cultural pressure. And, the, and, and, and that really the result in his life of what I call the isms, the heart of hypocrisy in the church always shows up when we take on our uh, us versus them mentality, resulting in isms, racism, classism, legalism, socialism, intellectualism are all rooted in me-isms, amen. What makes me right, what makes me comfortable. The need to prove ourselves righteous outside of the finished work of cross is what gets us into the isms. But he goes on and he says in verses 15 to 16, he says, he says, we're Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. And yet, because we know that a person is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ, even when we ourselves have believed in Christ Jesus, this was so that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no human being is justified. Paul continues to push for clarity concerning the gospel and the effects of God's grace. He reminds Peter and the brothers that they have been justified by faith. Paul, Paul expands his ministry from a personal one-on-one -on -one ministry with Peter, and he expands it to these other brothers, these Judaizers who have come down uh, 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 and come down, amen. He expands it. He says, I want to remind all of you, amen, that our hope, our, our, our hope, our confidence is in the gospel. It is in the person and finished work of Jesus Christ. It is not in any political system. It is not in any legal system. It's not in any religious system. It is in our hearts being transformed. It is us being redeemed. It is us being renewed. It is found in the life that can only be found in Christ Jesus. That's why I love 2 Corinthians 5 that says to you and I that you and I are new creatures in Christ. Behold, all things have been made new. Other things have passed away. Who I used to be, how I used to think, amen, has all changed because of the one who has entered into my time and space to change my life forever. What we constantly resist, the urge to believe that our pedigree, performance, position, or popularity gives us the right to proclaim our faith in a way that God has never intended. When we remind ourselves how the law and all of its rituals fell short to embrace the practice and proclamation of the clarity of the gospel in our lives to others. We must never allow pedigree, performance, position, or popularity, or politics to make us proclaim another gospel. We must practice and proclaim with clarity the gospel of Jesus Christ in our lives and claim that to others. He goes on in verses 17 through 19, he reminds us of, of, of our self-serving attempt in living out our faith apart from Christ or senseless and a serious error with the clarity of the gospel. But we ourselves are also found to be sinners. Do you catch that? He says, but we, you and I, we find ourselves to be sinners in need of a savior. And he goes on and says, and while seeking to be justified by Christ, it is Christ then a promoter of sin? Absolutely not. If I rebuild those things that I tore down, I show myself to be a lawbreaker. And for though the law, I died to the law so that I might live to God. Here's the deal. 
Peter's proclamation and practices did not match up with a clear gospel call for biblical community, right? He was practicing what I call a stand at odds gospel, a standalone gospel. He had become, he had become hypocritical and phony in his proclamation. He was, he was what I would say two-faced. He was saying one thing before the Jewish friends showed up and another after they showed up. He was hanging with the fellows, but then he was pulling away. He wanted to be included in all circles. And here's what I'm calling us to do. We must be willing to take a stand, not our stand, but God's stand. We must stand on truth and righteousness, on justice and mercy, on love and reconciliation. That must be who we are. In fact, we are ambassadors for such things. So how do we avoid the cultural Christianity and live out a clear gospel and promote a true gospel community both locally and globally? He wraps up in verses 20 to 21. We remind ourselves that we have been crucified with Christ and that we no longer live for ourselves, but Christ lives in us. Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live in the body, I live, catch that, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself to me. I do not set aside the grace of God, for it is righteousness comes through the law, then Christ died for nothing. We remind ourselves that that same grace that saved us, delivered us, gave us hope, is available not only to us every day, but it's available to every sinner who does not know Jesus. And that we become great extenders in the gospel. That we become the arms. We become the feet. We become, we become the heart of God to a lost and dying world. In other words, we become counter to the current culture with our messaging and our hope in our lives. That's what God has called us to, Right? We are to surrender to Christ. We are to be crucified with him. We are to put the deeds of the flesh into the grave and embrace the gospel and fight for it in, in our communities, right? We are to resist becoming part of the culture and allowing the culture to seep in and influence us. No, we're called to influence the culture all around us. And to see, and it is in the context of showing this beauty of redemption in him alone that people begin to have their eyes open and their hearts softened because the grace found in the gospel demands it of all of us. Now, I don't know where you stand on all of the chaos that's going on, but here's where I stand. I'm standing with Jesus. I'm standing with righteousness. I'm standing with the gospel. And I'm saying, God, start with me. And I'm challenging you to say the same deal. Lord, start with me. Let me have the ministry of reconciliation, not of division. Why? Because I have been reconciled to Christ. Let me pray with us. Father, in the name of Jesus, when you move on somebody's heart, in the church, outside the church, and draw them to you today. Remind those who are saved of your grace and your power and your might. And those who don't know you, God, call them to you, yourself today. Let somebody cry out, what must I do to be saved? Let somebody move from whatever their isms are to Jesus Christ, the Savior. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you've trusted Jesus today as your Savior, I want to extend you an invitation to reach out to us. We'd like to share some tools with you. We'd like to get you started. If you're not in the humble area, we'd like to find, uh, help you find a good Bible teaching church home. Just DM us or go to the chat box on our, uh, face, on, our, on our webpage or hit us up on Facebook. We'll love to get with you and get you started on your journey with Jesus. Until we see each other again, God bless you and God keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May you experience the peace of God in your life. In Jesus' name, go and win the week. Blessings.